for how long did you wake up every morning at the same exact time With and a go, oh, how, yeah. how long did that last? Maybe seven years. Seven years. I used to wake every up morning. 4 a.m. The panic attack. Yeah, that was pretty bad. That was bad. Seven years. Did you that, do? Yeah. Were you doing anything to counter it that time? Not really. No, I think it's like it's panic attacks are weird because you can. I had one on stage in in Australia once, and I was like in front of four thousand people, and the gig went great, and I had a panic attack. And it's. I don't did know, you I say to, you were having a panic attack? No, uh, I. And did you listen I, back to got, the performance? We've got, Panic attack stories, right? The um, the, <laughs> yeah. we do. Um, I the, should tell the story. No, finish it and then. Okay, I'll tell so that. so the panic attack. Like, if if you haven't had one, fabulous, and I, I you never need to experience it. Yep. But if you the first one is the scariest. After that, they're they're okay. The first one is like I can't. You get have comfortable no in idea what's happening. Skin. Yeah. I I I can't stand up. I can't sit down. I don't want to eat. I'm hungry. I want to sleep. I'm not tired. I, like it's everything. It's incredibly uncomfortable. But you can function through it. There's no sense of ah, and I thought it's, there's something about my voice and the way that I present myself. Where if I say I'm very insecure, and that's why I tell all these jokes, and I I, I don't I'm not very self confident, and I think I'm a dummy. There's something about my voice where you go, you can hear it on one level, and another bit of you is going, no, yeah, it's fine, very successful British man, don't worry about it. Yeah, the, the, you have to be aware of how the world perceives you. And then mediate between the two. It feels like that, you know, sometimes like me having a panic attack because I don't sound like I'm having a panic no. attack. So, okay. Did, did, did it start well, I on think stage? Caroline is often surprised. Mother half is often surprised if I go, uh, I'm feeling a bit down. Yeah. You seem fine. Yeah. What are you talking about? You're like an emotional, uh, are they called Bobbies? The guy who's standing well, in front of the... the... The Overton window of my emotion is, is, is that like, you can get, you know, you get given a Netflix special. It's like you're filming it. It goes great. It's a huge deal. And I'm, oh, good. And then, you know, something, uh, your friend died. Oh, okay. It's like, are you talking about that's what people's expectations are? Or that's what your that's experience kinda is? That's kind of how, that's how I present. It's yes. not how I feel. I feel overjoyed and I feel sorrow. But I think I present fairly. Yeah, steady. Yeah. You're like the guy who stands in front of Downing Street. Mm. The soldiers who won't, the fur hat yeah. and all that shit. My panic attack story involving Jimmy was, so it's fairly laborious in terms of how I started having them. Had started having them two weeks before three mics. And then I went on Zoloft after that. They stopped. And uh, and then I'd stopped taking Zoloft again. I'm in London with Dave Chappelle. And J Jimmy's there. Uh, at, came to the show. And it was Dave's show. And I go on stage. Here's what happened. Trevor Noah had told me that people in England just heckle freely as like part of the show so i i'm like fuck it's the same theater i think he did and i'm like i'm fine like and and cena dave's roman yeah. was like hey you got to go out now and i was like what and then i go on stage james and jamila are there and i do a minute and i can feel the i'm getting tunnel vision can't breathe can't think and i was just like yeah mm, hey jimmy Come, come on out. And I go, Jimmy Carr. And he goes, they're very happy to see you. And I go backstage, catch my, it's once I, it only takes about 40 seconds to but clear my body. But it, like, I don't know yeah. time. Yeah. Of course. And then you brought me back out and I did a good set. So, yeah. but it was like, it was kind of unfortunate, but I could tell. Like tag team, tag team wrestling. Yeah. Um, so, so I understand panic text. Now I take a beta blocker and they, I, I get none I, before I go on stage. Oh, right. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I kind of don't like medicating. I, I, I kind of not like, I like to feel my feelings. I like to kind of go, okay, well, I'll, I'll feel that. And I, as long as it's not really bad, like I got beta blockers one time when I got canceled, I got, uh, I got some beta blockers. It was the, the, the tax thing that I had like in 2012. Jimmy's had two scandals, taxes oh, and, a, and, a, a and a many scandals in between. Not all of them make it to the States. Got it. Okay. I get, I get canceled about about every two years. There's there's an incident. Great. Uh, normally a joke, which is fine, you know, because yeah. you've got to right size it. I told a joke. Some people didn't like it. Yep. That's kind of okay. Uh, but when it's a big thing, the tax thing really felt like, oh, this could be not an existential crisis, but this could end your career or could change it. And I got beta blockers. I remember taking one the first day. I think, oh, okay, everything feels all right. And they just had them as a as sort of a talisman. It's mm -hmm. like, a, okay, they're there if you need them. Don't need them. Right, but weirdly, you'd rather, yeah. I use Downton Abbey. Go I think on. it has the same effect as Valium. It's a very chill show. Yeah. Nothing shocking is going to happen. I found it very calming. 
So what you just do you kind watch? Of hadn't watched any of them. Hadn't watched any of them, and then watched those like for like ten nights in a row. Watched the season. I just really found it very kind of grounding. I don't know why, but sometimes it's like that thing of like, what are you going to go to when you're feeling like going? Well, people use, use comedy that? for that. Yeah, I think a lot of people use comedy for that. I started meditation when I was 25. And did you stick with it? Yeah, I do it twice a day, every day. For the TM? Yeah. Great. What's your mantra? I'm kidding. <laughs> what made you start? You just didn't like your in your body experience? Uh, I was getting anxiety attacks and panic attacks. I, I would have panic attacks about nothing. I would have anxiety attacks like in meetings and auditions and stuff like that. And there is some stuff that's like natural performance anxiety, sure. you, know, you know, stage fright, which is like normal, but um, it, it doesn't, it just didn't feel normal. I just wanted like more agency over my mind. Did it like start helping immediately? Immediately. Meditation started For helping immediately. Um, immediately and, and, I, and I'm not perfect I don't claim to be but it definitely it, it definitely like it's it's just part of my body what, now and it's, it's part of my routine I yeah think it's like a it's like a hunger it's like a, oh it's lunchtime you know it's like time for the second meditation the great day. do you feel your thoughts changing before you're like all right I gotta sit meaning does it like does the morning sit start to wear off and then yeah usually in that like post lunch lull I'll do my second meditation where a European person would take a three-hour siesta, I'd do my second 20-minute. I don't know why you have to bring the Europeans into it <laughs> in a negative way. And I don't think you mean that European. That wasn't in a negative way. I'm like, they got it oh, made. Yeah, they, yeah, I wish right. I had a three-hour. I wish we could do You're right. You know, you're not French wrong. French hours on set and stuff. Like um, okay, so that slowly got better, the the anxiety. And you did you stop having, like, attacks in high-pressure situations? I stopped having, like, full white out disassoci disassociative like full blown panic. Attacks. What would you do when you had them? When before you started meditating? I would be completely out of body and I would flop sweat and could you see it? Were you looking at yourself or you were just like it wasn't you couldn't operate? I would sometimes operate. Sometimes I would the very first stand up set I did on television was live at Gotham and I was like completely out of body for the first joke. I made the mistake of like inviting a bunch of high school friends to the taping and they yep. sat them all front row, which yep. is like total amateur hour. I remember looking at the tape and being like, well, oh, it was totally fine. I couldn't, I couldn't tell at all. Really? I couldn't tell at all. Yeah, that is funny where you went, cause I had some panic attacks on stage and, and then I would listen back and it wasn't that bad, yeah. but it's so, it would ruin, even if you get through the first joke, you're upset the whole time yeah because you're like why did that happen yeah because you don't know you yeah. have no idea yeah i started taking beta blockers on stage yeah i the beta blockers i tried a little bit and they made me feel a little bit strange but uh uh it's better than having a panic attack yeah it's better than having a yeah and i don't, they don't make me feel strange yeah um they just make me crush <laughs> <laughs> have you seen my comedy? Um, I haven't. You're very, very good at it. Get, uh, okay, so you you had anxiety on stage, and you would have them in life. Like, do you? Yeah, I would have them in life. <clears throat> I've been having pretty bad anxiety lately. I think just from I was doing pretty good, like everybody. This sounds hack. I was doing pretty damn good until I want to say pretty damn good, but I was doing pretty good until quarantine. Quarantine. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of drinking. In quarantine. And my dad got cancer in quarantine. And then he died. In December but uh so that was that's been tough and um, you just from like an idle mind you were sitting there and you were like I yeah it was just the end of the world I mean like it was during the George Floyd stuff and Trump was turning the country into a military state I was stuck in my house for two years and just like couldn't do stand up and couldn't shoot and uh, you know yeah I, you know, I loved it <laughs> Did you really? Part, there were parts of it I absolutely <clears throat> There was loved. parts of it that I that were kind of like an amazing reset on society. Yeah. And you got to like read the book you've been meaning to read and like whatever take the cook more and there there were there were The Art of the Deal. There that was the cooked. that was the book I was trying to read. <laughs> Art of the Deal, Mind Calm. And then I would cook my and I would cook my Trump steaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm with you, but you 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 quickly realized that like ah this is not working for me i mean i'm still realizing it i don't know it was uh i wasn't making the healthiest choices i probably wasn't exercising as much but like uh life is in chapters and waves and cycles and stuff like that so have you figured yours out or you only see them in retrospect 
I think you're constantly figuring them out, maybe. I think you're constantly figuring them out. It is like yeah. I told Taylor Townsend, it's like you just go like, all right, here's my new idea for how to do it. Yeah. And you just go, it's like a, it's like we all have these like fucking hoopty cars and we're like, I put tape under the chassis uh -huh. and I'm wrapping it around uh -huh. and then I'm going to run it off uh, peanut oil. Uh -huh. and, and you just go like, I'm going to meditate and then I'm going to exercise more uh -huh. and then I'm, but I'm not going to shoot and I'm going to live here. Yeah. And you just go like, I don't, maybe, and if it works for a year, fucking great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I also have to when you when you're going through anxiety or, or depression, you feel like you're all alone and you're the only one on earth experiencing it. Yeah. But my therapist says like amoebas have anxiety. Every living creature experiences anxiety in some shape or form. It's the amount and how often you're uh, um, facing it that makes it you know potentially crossing over into Small anxiety world. disorder. But like it, every like. I used to feel all alone. For many years, I, f you f I felt all alone in my anxiety, but uh, the well, the world shares my pain. Not more everybody. than not. Yeah, more than not. They say 10%, but it's like, it's more than 10%. <laughs> well, it's going to be 90%. Well, when it, you start talking about to, to yes. other people, like, have you ever had a panic attack? They're like, fuck yeah. Have you yeah, had an anxiety attack? Right yeah, my anxiety's through the roof. Have you had depressive spells? Yeah. Like, when you yeah. start talking to people about it, you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, alone and also my therapist will be like you do pranks where people are pulling knives out on you and chasing you with your dick and balls out in the <laughs> middle of the street like yeah. that's anxiety provoking you, it's okay to feel you're a bitch if you feel anxiety <laughs> <laughs> you are that's you my therapist said you're a fucking bitch <laughs> you're if a you bitch. feel <laughs> and do you want this or not do you want to have do you want to get picked up for a fifth season can or you not? imagine the worst therapist <laughs> um so um, anxiety uh, has been with me my whole life. Where, when it really started to show up was when I was about 23, 24, I started having panic attacks and anxiety attacks. Where? Uh, I was living in New York. I was living in Brooklyn. I was unemployed. I was just out of acting school. Um, and they were, they would crush me. They would come out of nowhere for no reason. Mostly for no reason, sometimes for a reason. How did you figure out what the reasons were? One of the reasons, one of the triggers was on, you know, when you're taking New York subways and it's just, you're like, and it just stops. Yeah. And it just goes off and it just goes. Yeah. And it's just like deathly quiet. I would start to get a panic attack. Like we're going to die. I'm going to get crushed. The East River, which is above my head, yep. is going to fall down. And sweat would start pouring down my forehead. My heart would just start pounding. I, my mu muscles would start would, would start flexing and I couldn't catch my breath and I was certain I was going to pass out. Fortunately, at that point, I had had many of these, dozens of these. The first couple of ones, I was on the verge of calling an ambulance. I think once I did call an ambulance and then canceled it because um, I thought I was having a heart attack. You're but, on the street at this point? You're not in the subway? Uh, yeah, that was just at yeah. home. And sometimes they would just happen for no reason, like watching TV, reading a magazine, and all of a sudden this panic attack would come on and I would feel like I'm gonna die. So shortness of breath, tunnel vision, yeah, throat tight. Palpitation, sweating. And I was in, I had just started therapy and you know, got diagnosed kind of with an anxiety disorder. And then it's been 20, 30 years of unpacking. Like, you know, my mom took off when I was a year and a half old. My parent, my dad got instantly remarried in a really unhappy and some would say kind of abusive home situation. And anytime you have kind of like a, a an abandoned kid living in kind of a rage filled loveless home, that's a recipe for anxiety, you know, yeah. because you don't know, you don't have a permanency like, oh shoot, what's going to happen next? Yeah, and the foundation is- Foundation is- Barely is, there. So, the the panic attacks went away, but I've been dealing with uh, and a lot of like stuff around which I've talked a lot about. I don't really want to get into too much about you know drug and alcohol abuse, but I'm I'm poly addicted and anything is porn. I had a gambling phase, you name it. Um, uh, whatever I can do to try and medicate that anxiety, I, I realized that that was a source of the addiction stuff too. So nowadays, I I liken myself as someone that has. Um, 
uh, diabetes where you've got to like take your blood pressure and your blood sugar and you've got to monitor and go into the doctor every once in a while. And it's just, it's something I can live with and something I can even thrive with, but I've got to be very, very careful about it because it can take the reins and, and also it can kind of make me a dick. And there was many years where my, I would let my anxiety run the show, especially around workaholism, which is an addiction that not a lot of people talk about. You know, the, my constant- Well, it's like the good one. You, you mean you yeah. love to grind? Yeah, yeah. I remember, love to grind too much. I remember back when I used to read Vanity Fair, they would always have in the back like some titan billionaire. Yeah. And it would be like, and he's got four divorces and he never sees his kids, yeah. but he's made all this money and started all these businesses and he works 87 hours a week. And he's like, oh, we're supposed to look up to, this yes. is a titan of industry, yeah. you know, a yeah. job creator. Well, again, that's not vanity, even Vanity Fair or it's all of American culture. Yeah. Now it's every podcast. Yeah. How it's, are you going to grind? Yeah. Yeah. You need to drink juice and fucking cold sauna or cold plunge and then you'll you're going to be a star. Here's how you build your audience yeah. and, and whatnot. So, but anxiety feeds into that, like approval, show business, you know, um, wanting acceptance and uh, uh, people pleasing. It's all connected. I accidentally spewed the fact that I was suffering from something called OCD on the Howard Stern show. What year was that? 1999, 98. Yeah, I was going to guess that. Yeah, it was on the E show. No, it was on no? his radio show. No, 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 but they would air it on E. They, maybe they I don't know if this point. was, I don't know if this was aired on E. I, I've told the story many times, but he was, he, I was in there like he did on his radio show. He always had like uh, multiple guests on at once, and he had the guy on that was uh, from Puppetry of the Penis. Mm-hmm. The guy was doing things with yeah. his dick. And I, I started focusing. I had already gone to a therapy and I had OCD. This is a long time before the Me Too movement. Men used to do puppetry with their penis. Before Me Too, you could, people loved it. You're not allowed to do that anymore? Not as much. Not no, as I much. think they're allowed to. It's, you're just not allowed to have a subordinate. You, do right, the you can't, you have to tell them, you have to tell them ahead of time. Well, they can't do the you puppetry have to for it. you. <laughs> I need you. To, they, <laughs> She's operating the puppet. <laughs> anyway, the point that I'm making is that I I couldn't, I saw the guy touching his dick and then leave. And I, I was just focused on the door because he had touched the door. It was in the summer. I'm wearing short sleeves. He finished his interview with me. And I said, uh, he said, you can, whatever, I can go now. And he said, uh, and I said, can somebody open the door? I don't want to touch the door. The guy touched his dick and I don't want to touch the door. They go, open the door. I go, no, I went to grab some tissue to open the door with the tissue. They knocked that out of my hand. I, I went to open it with the, my shirt. Uh, somebody knocked. I literally that thought out. you were going to say you open it with your dick. Go ahead. This is my puppet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, I started to hyperventilate and I was having an anxiety attack. And I said to Howard, I said, I, and this is funny. I get it. You know, I, I get it. But I, I, I'll be totally honest with you. I've been to a psychiatrist and I've been diagnosed with something called obsessive compulsive disorder. And I take medication and I'm about to pass out. So if you don't open the door for me, then somebody should call 911 because I, I can't, I'm, not, I'm this close to not being conscious. And he said, sorry. And he opened the door. And I walked out in the hall and I realized I heard in the speakers in the hall, they were still broadcasting. I thought we were in a commercial break. So you know, this was a national radio oh, wow. show. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, wow. And my heart fucking dropped into my stomach and I was beside myself. Who knows at this point? Your family. That's the list and probably yeah, Rodenberg and No, just my family. Just my wife, really. I didn't even tell the kids. But um, I, uh, I thought, oh my God, this just got nationally broadcast. So this is the end. This is the end. I never felt like the end of the fucking world. And for many reasons, first, this is getting broadcast nationally. So my whole family is hearing it. My kids are of school age. They're going to have to go to school the next day. And everybody's going to know that their father is a mental case, which is a big piece of news, number one. And so everybody I love is going to be humiliated, aside from me. Um, Now that I've kind of said that I'm on medication and I go to a psychiatrist, who's ever going to hire me? You know, when you do... 
television shows and movies, you always have a, uh, a doctor come and give you a physical beforehand. Mm -hmm. And now I've kind of let it out of the bad that, that it's even worse. I have mental health issues. Why would you hire me? Why would you put me in million dollar productions? Yeah. If I could flip out at any moment, you don't know what. Could well, happen. we know the answer because Ellen passed. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that was my mind. I said, like, what's the best thing to do? You know, I'll go downstairs. It's New York and I'll just run into the traffic. And uh, I, I, I've never felt more dark and more alone than in that moment. And the elevator door, the elevator went to the bottom and the elevator door opened and you see the, the streets of Manhattan teeming the, the busiest place on earth. And I've never felt more alone and more lonely. And I'm walking toward the doors, toward the traffic and the, the sliding doors, the elect automatic doors open. And I step out on the sidewalk and I'm just taking a breath and maybe looking for a countdown to, to run into the traffic. And some guy comes into my periphery. I didn't turn my head and he goes, are you Howie Mandel? And I said, yeah. And he said, were you just on Howard Stern? And I went, yeah. And my, I don't think my heart could have dropped any further. And right before I took the first step, he goes, and this is before this movement, he goes, me too. And I went, what, what does that mean? And he goes, no, I have issues too. You were talking about the same thing I have. Thank you. I said, thank you for what? He goes, I suffer from this too. And it was the first time it's like somebody threw me a life preserver. I go, you really, it's not just me. It's you. And there was a stranger. And that was like this weight got lifted off my fucking shoulder. And at that time, there was no Wi-Fi. We didn't have the internet. And I went home and in the subsequent weeks, every day I got 50 letters yeah. and mail from people going, I heard you on Howard Stern. Thank you so much. I heard you on Howard Stern. And as much as these people claim that it helped them, I can't tell you how much these messages helped me. So the biggest savior, the biggest opening of a huge block in my life is words, words. And that's why you, that's why you doing this podcast is really, really important. It's not only, I told you, I, I listen to people it. tell me every, I get messages every day. People thanking me. I, I was me really honored that you would ask me to be part of it. I love you. I love what you do. And I love the special, but I just think that the fact that you've created a forum because I know how much this helped me. Yeah. A forum where people are open. And it's also, is it, it's probably still staggering to you how many people it are like living their you in the elevator. What's and then this? someone like you in, in this case, it's OCD in my case, depression or people have anxiety or Taylor Thompson talks about, you know, or Mulaney Taylor talks about bipolar and Mulaney talks about drug addiction and all these things. People are like, fuck. Oh yeah. Well, I don't think there's anybody alive, any human being that at some point in the span of their life, they're not going to need a coping skill. Mm -hmm. You know, things like OCD and clinical depression and bipolar and schizophrenia are um, manageable issues, mm -hmm. you know, if taken care of. It's hard to find where you can get that managed. That's the, that's the other thing. And they're, they're debilitating. But I'm, uh, beyond that, you know, just a cope, life is hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that people have a hard time coping and they don't go, you know, becoming a parent is the most overwhelming thing. It's, it's joyful, but it's also, there's a lot of pressure losing, you know, you talk about the economy, losing a job, not being able to pay your rent, dealing with have, what you're doing with your mother, dealing with what I'm dealing or dealing with the loss of loved ones yeah. and family members and dealing with the trauma of, of your upbringing and dealing with it. The, there isn't anybody alive. And it's so unbelievable to me. And I say this a lot that we don't take care of our mental health the way we take care of our dental health. And if somebody, you know, you'll go to the dentist and get x-rays and go, look, mom, no cavities. There's nothing wrong. And you're getting checked. Why is it not part of our curriculum where we can just openly talk or go to somebody and find out, get coping skills and figure, figure it out. And I think that that would be the solve to most of our world's problems. Hey, did you like that? Did you like that? Yeah, did you like it though? You want more? Don't want to work? Would rather watch videos of me grab assing with people? First of all, go up here to subscribe.
and then go up here to uh, watch more clips. This is like when the weatherman says that there's a high pressure system coming in. I'm, a little, I'm not really used to the green screen. 